I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wiradjuri people, the traditional custodians of the land. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And now I'll get to John. It is my pleasure to introduce John Ebert to Bathurst Library. John is a lawyer by training who, for 30 years, has performed various roles and functions across Australia for the Taxation Office. John is here tonight to talk to us as part of the History Council New South Wales Speaker Connect program and also History Week 2020. John commenced postgraduate studies in 2005 and part of his research led him to a ship called the Denera, the Denera, the Denera, and its internees. In 1940, the ship brought 2,500 men from England to Australia. They were from Germany, Austria, and Italy. John, who is now on the committee of the Denera Association, is here to discuss the stories of these men, including who they were, why they were sent here, and what happened to them. So please join me in welcoming John. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the work that Mary and her team have done in arranging tonight's talk. And also I'd like to acknowledge the History Council of New South Wales that has invited me to speak as part of History Week. Because the History Council of New South Wales every year have a critical theme for History Week. This year's theme is history. What is it good for? So we thought, let's talk about it, and we're going to be speaking about the Denera. But how I got interested in this topic is even more interesting before we start talking about the Denera. As Mary said, I'm a lawyer by training and I decided to do some postgraduate studies with the thought of teaching history in my retirement. And I enrolled in Charles Sturt at Bathurst, so I've got a link to Bathurst. And uh, I was an external student and the assignment topic was either the communist threat in the 1950s or the Denera. Well, at that critical point in 2005, I'd never even heard of the Denera. So I wrote this assignment and I got a good mark for it. And when I got my mark back, I thought I'd track down some of the Denera boys. And believe me, I found several of them. One of them, I'll talk about a bit later, became a judge of the family court. And he invited me to come to a reunion in Melbourne. But more about this slide a bit later. The background to the era is important because it has to be looked in the context of what happened. In England, when the war broke out in September of 1939, the British government got nervous about people being there who weren't British. They identified that there were thousands, literally, of German, Austrian and Italians living in England. And so, particularly after the fall of France, the Low Countries, Nor Norway, they even got more nervous. So the British government, Winston Churchill no less, wrote to the Australian Prime Minister and used the expression saying, there are large numbers of dangerous or potentially dangerous persons involved, and these people would be a danger if given the opportunity to assist the enemy. Will you take them to Australia? <laughs> Menzies, ever the great supporter of the Poms, said, yes, we'll take 6,000. But it didn't it take, they didn't use that to get 6,000. They got a lesser number, they got 2,500. But anyway, after the fall of France, the British decided to send someone across the Atlantic, believe it or not, to America, to Canada. And a ship called the Arundora Star, some of you will have heard of that, it was sunk, and thousands, or sorry, hundreds of internees drowned on the way to Canada. Those who survived were brought back to Australia. Other than era boys of German, Austrian, Italian, were rounded up and sent out to Australia. The really surprising thing is then they were then sent. They arrived in Hay, in the um, Riverina, Chichura in Victoria, and some of the new boys also went to Orange. One thing I should have said at the outset, I'd like to dedicate this speech to a man named Stephen Strauss. He was the man who became a judge of the family court. He's the man who encouraged me and invited me first to speak about the new issues. And in any speech I give, I always identify him as the great encouragement. So these the new boys were sent out to Australia largely, and 
then many of them were later released and made a major impact on their lives in the community. For Australia, some of them went back to England during the war because they had loved ones still in England. Some of them went back after the war. So who were these Madeira boys? Well, in doing the assignment, one of the things I found was that a large majority decided to remain in Australia at the end of the war. And those even who'd gone back, many came back. And I thought, why would they do that? And so I did some research and found out that there were two reasons. One, where they originally came from was now Eastern Europe. Why would you go back to a communist hot country? But then I found a report that told me that over 95% of these internees who Winston said would join the German army or assist the enemy were Jewish. They had escaped it from the 30s to England and lo and behold, Winston said, they joined the German army. Shall we say the lawyer he was outraged and my focus changed from a, a, a history-based analysis to a legal human rights assignment. So, and on top of that, the Italians, many of them were British subjects. And we'll talk about some of these Italians a bit later. So they were sent out to Hay, as I said, in the Riverina, but their first stop was Melbourne. And that's a photograph of the ship to the era arriving in Melbourne. I tried to get some copies made, but there are copyright laws in this country and I have to be careful what I say and hand out. So they arrived there, and then on last Sunday, the 6th of September, 1940, last Sunday was the 80th anniversary of the New York Boys arriving in Sydney. Perhaps some of you might know the New York Boys. I've already met a lady tonight whose father was a New York Boy. A couple here, they are related to their uncle. But some of you might even know the New York Boys. If you do, please contact Mary and give her my details because I'd love to know them. You might say, well, that's not going to happen. Well, over 400 went to Orange. And after the war, they may have settled in this community. It may be a De Niro boy here tonight. You might say, stranger things don't happen. And I said, well, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine wrote a, an article for a newspaper in the, New York about the De Niro. And a man wrote to the editor and said, I'm a Jewish rabbi. I was on the De Niro. I was 17 years old. And we hadn't heard of that man for over 50 years. And suddenly this man we found as a rabbi in New York. So when they arrived in Sydney, this is a photo of Darling Harbour. This is the De Niro here. You might say, what's the train track? That train track is still there at Darling Harbour, Jones Bay Wharf. That train took them to Hay in the River Arena. When they arrived in Melbourne, they went to Chitura, and after Hay, some of them were then relocated to uh, Chitura. And from there, many of them were released later, but that train track, as I said, is still there. Some of them, during the course of their period in Hay, were at, went out to Orange. Orange was felt to be a better climate than Hay. One to new boy described Hay as being the stop before hell. It was 102 degrees Fahrenheit when they arrived. When they left England, it was snowing. And this is a photo that I found in the Charles Sturt University archives of the camp in Orange. Unlike Hay and Chitura, the buildings where the internees slept were largely showground buildings, and many of them had to sleep on the floor. We'll talk about it a bit later. Another ship came out later, the Queen Mary, believe it or not, who brought internees from Singapore. 266 men, women and children, largely Jewish, who the government rounded up in Singapore before the Japs arrived, and they sent them to Australia. And while they're out here, 10 babies, believe it or not, were born in internment in Australia. Now this train, as I said, took the Deere boys to, when they're in Hay, they learnt many skills because many of them were rather intelligent. They learnt to speak other languages, they learnt to do English, they learnt handicrafts, entertainment, some of them were keen artists, 
Some of them were cooks, so they had Viennese cooks and Italian chefs. So they did not too bad. But these people who Churchill said would join the enemy, within six months of arriving, there was a report by a man called E. Morris, I don't know his first name, sorry, and he reported that these people attended a play that was put on by the Lira boys. And at the end of the play that night, these internees, six months after their arrival, entered the theatre by singing God Save the King. Pretty surprising, Winston, but anyway, that's another story. These huts each had a leader, so the huts and the camps, both in Hay and Chitura, had leaders, and these leaders were able to negotiate issues with the Australian military. They've kept these people behind barbed wire, even though, as I said before, many of them were not really a threat to security, but that's what, how they were kept. A bit about the orange camp. In the diary of one of the new boys, Michael Sondheim, he writes, the internees who were real, largely the orange, had better facilities to handle the sick. Some fit internees were there, but orange housed with people housed in the local showgrounds, the stock and buildings were slept on, but the floor was where people slept. Unfortunately, there was a shortage of firewood for stoves and coppers, so it must have been pretty bleak sleeping on the floor in orange in the middle of winter. But unlike Hay and Chitura, those in Orange could come into the town with leave from the camp. They could go for a stroll into the town to buy some cigarettes or perhaps go to the local tavern. But that wasn't given to them when they're in Hay and Chitura. Well, I have searched for a list of the new boys who ended up in Hay. Um, well, I haven't been able to find a list anywhere or even something to indicate the names. Sure, I could go through all the internment files of each and every one of them, but I do know that Stephen Strauss was unwell and he was sent to, Hay to, uh, to Orange to recuperate. But one famous person was in Orange, other than Stephen Strauss, a man by the name of Ludwig Hirschfeld Mack. He was a famous artist. Some of you might have seen this painting, drawing, a lithograph that he did of internment in Orange. He was in Orange when he drew it. It is subject to copyright, I can't hand it out, I'm sorry. And it expresses the view that even though this man here is behind the barbed wire, he can look up at the stars that give him hope of life beyond the camp, or perhaps the unknown. We don't know really what it represents, but I think it shows the starkness of it. He looks up in wonderment at the the heavens, or perhaps looks up and thinks, if only I could get over that fence. And he was an internally there. And after the war, he stayed here and did many famous works. And this book here that Mary has put here is a book, the second volume has come out talking about some of the internees. But in there, there were probably on a fair estimate about a hundred paintings, not only by Hirschfeld Mack, but by other artists who were on the Danira. As I said before, over 400 internees went from Hay to Orange. So there might be some of you still out there. But of course, with the fullness of time, the British realised, well, not that they admitted it, but they made a mistake. They decided to uh, send Major Layton to Australia to investigate the issue. A lot of the Lira boys had complained about their treatment during the voyage. A lot of them complained about the standard that they, living, that they were living under. So Major Layton was sent by the Home Office and he came to Australia in Hay in April 1941. He found that a number of the Lira boys had been badly treated, their furniture, their personal effects had been thrown overboard during the voyage. And so he recommended to the government that be compensated. Secondly, he found that a number of the British crew had, uh, unfair or had treated unfairly these internees. Three of them were court-martialed. I haven't been able to find the record of the court martial Because one of the problems is when the British government decided this internment issue, they put an embargo of 100 years 
on anything to do with, with the Nira. You can get some documents out of them, but things like um, internment files are okay through the National Archives, but things like uh, court martial records or other records, very difficult to come by. He found that the, uh, the, the three people had to be court martialed, including the captain of the Denira, Lieutenant Colonel Scott. But the interesting one who was court martialed was a man called Sergeant O'Neill. He won the Victoria Cross for England during World War I. But all I found is a newspaper report of it. I haven't found the transcript or the court martial records. But a result of the court martial against him, his Victoria Cross was revoked by the British government. I've never heard of any other soldier losing a Victoria Cross. But before he died, he was reinstated, the British gave him back to him. Interesting about uh, Major Layton, he recommended that the Nero boys be released and they'd be given three options. First option was they could join the Australian Army, but being enemies, they couldn't hold a gun or a weapon. They could pick fruit in the Riverina, perhaps. They could work in munitions factories, but they could not hold a weapon. And the other reason for not holding, uh, letting them do that is if they were captured, they would have a strong Germanic or Austrian Italian accent, and that might endanger other troops. Particularly if they had to kill one of their own former countrymen. So they could, they could join a group called the Eighth Employment Company. There was a Captain Broughton who became a father figure to the New Boys, and he's very well respected by the New Boys when you ask him about the Eighth Employment Company. 551 internees agreed to be released and served in the Australian Army. And they wore the slouch hat and their military files are on the National Archives are as many soldiers. They could remain in, behind barbed wire. Many of them didn't want anything to do with the military because they see that in Germany and Austria they were really anything military they didn't want to know about. And so they, they, some of them agreed to stay behind barbed wire. Thirdly, they could go back to England. 1942, a bit dangerous, but we'll talk about the ships in a moment. Many of them did go back to England and they joined a, a group called the Pioneer Corps. Many of them served faithful service for the Allies in World War II. One of them we'll talk about, he served in the Battle of the Bulge under Patton. Some of them have actually served in all sorts of theatres. Some of them served in Bomber Command. Some of them served in the Royal Navy. And uh, we didn't know all these stories, but some of the stories I've learned are interesting. 103 were felt to be more Nazi driven and they were transferred to other prisoner of war camps within Australia. I did read a report, but again, trying to find some basis for it or something to support it. It tells me that three De Niro boys told the Australian government, no, we don't want to go back to England. We're German nationals. We want to go back to Germany. And the government agreed they could go back and they got them back to Germany via Switzerland during the war. Who they were or what they were, I'm sorry, I do not know. Perhaps next time we have a talk with this, I might be able to tell you, but I haven't been able to find it. One of the key questions people ask me, do you think they were Jewish? And I say, well, I'm really not sure because many of the Nero boys have told me, who I've spoken through the years to, have told me, even though they knew the Jewish people were persecuted by the Nazis in the 30s, and that's why they got to England, they knew nothing of the camps in the East. In fact, one of the Nero boy showed me when they were interned, they could ride home, ride home to their loved ones in Europe through Switzerland. Because under the Geneva Convention, the rules of war, a prisoner of war has a right to communicate with his family. And some of our Australian soldiers rode home even though they're prisoner of war. The Japs never agreed to it, but the Germans at least allowed it. And he showed me this letter this day. He wrote to his mother and father in Germany in 1942. And the letter came back and in German, the English translation says, no longer here. And he said for three years, he never knew what that meant. And after the war, he went back home 
and his neighbour told him the Nazis came and took them away and they never came back. And interesting thing about it, he told me he met the man who reported his parents. The uh, Gestapo came to the sawmill where his father worked and wanted any of the Jews and this man identified this man's father. And I said, how did you feel? He said, well, what are we to say? You know, what could he do? And he was very forgiving, I thought. But so interesting to read these letters that some people wrote home to their loved ones. One of the, just on Julian Layton, one of the De Niro boys, uh, Herbert Bayer, one of the young De Niro boys, he became the first Jewish stockbroker in Australia. But his interesting claim to fame is he mar married the niece of Major Layton. How did they meet? Again, I'm sorry. Interesting, uh, when he passed away, he, I'm one of these people that's what's called a blooper detector, I find mistakes in papers, and uh, his death notice said he was the loving wife of Rosemary. <laughs> so these ships were sent out here and they came back. So 16 ships took turnage back to England and many of them got back. First ship left on the return voyage of the Deira, and. 13 internees went back, not all the way to England, some of them went to India, and some went across America. But the return voyage of the Nero, when it left Sydney, took 13 to Nero boys with them. And then there were another dozen or, dozen or so ships that went back at different times. Unfortunately, or regretfully, or two of the ships were sunk by a U-boat on the way back. And uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. One of these ships here, the Abosso, um, came about, it was sunk by a U-boat, not far from the Azores or the coast of Portugal. 43 De Niro boys went back to England, 42 drowned. And it took me three years, but I found the son of the one and only survived. And uh, he told me some amazing things. On the Abosso, as I said, there were 42 internees and 43 internees and 42 drowned. On top of that, there were people on the ship were the crew, obviously. There were RAF officers who were asked to guard these internees on their voyage back. Even though they had been accepted as no longer a threat, they felt they had to send RAF guards to guard them. And uh, a woman I speak to regularly in England, her father was one of the guards who survived. And there was a huge casualty rate. 396 were on the ship and 361, 365 drowned. 31 survived. They were made up of 14 of the crew, four service personnel, one internee, a few people from the Dutch Navy who we were training to uh, submarine warfare. And believe it or not, there were a number of civilians on the ship. They were going to England for a holiday. They said, this ship's going back to England, why don't we go to England for a holiday? Interesting, this ship that was sunk, a friend of mine was able to find me the log of the U-boat that sank it through the German archives. And uh, here was a translation that one of my Jewish friends decided to translate it for me into English. Interesting, at the end, the captain writes, the life rights are filled with wounded men. I don't feel like staying longer in the facility under the circumstances. And by the way, we're running low on fuel. Here's an interesting photo that a lady sent me. It's of the lifeboat when it was in the Atlantic just before it was picked up by the HMS Bidford. The lady I speak to, her father was one of the guards, so he's one of these people. We don't know which one it is. And uh, she told me that when they got on the Bidford, which was coming back from North Africa, they saw this lifeboat and they picked up the intern the, uh, the crew, the only one internee, Ugo Benelli, the Italian man. And when they were on the lifeboat, they were in the Atlantic for two days before they were rescued. And on day two, the lifeboat sprang a leak. 
How did they get the water out of the lake in the middle of the Atlantic? I am told that one of the lady paying passengers was wearing a hat and she had a handbag. So the sailor borrowed the hat and the handbag and for 36 hours bailed the water out of the lifeboat with Madame's handbag and hat. And every year on anniversary day of 29th of October, I put a message on Facebook to remember these four people who were in turn wrongly sent out and died on the way back. And I make mention, think of the presence of my to this woman. The ship has been hit by a torpedo. You told her to get into a lifeboat. And she thinks, oh, I've got to put my hat on and grab my handbag. But thankfully she did, because if she didn't, the lifeboat would have sunk. But some of these amazing stories you read about. This is the man who survived, Ugo Benelli. Interesting thing I learned from his son. It took me three years, I found his son. And one day, night, I rang and asked, I was trying to find the family of Ugo Benelli. And I remember this man said, Ugo was my stepfather. And, uh, but he survived three U-boat attacks. We were in Dora Star, and I should have mentioned De Niro, en route to Australia, a German U-boat fired a torpedo at it, and it went under the De Niro, and another one, it didn't explode. So he survived that, and he survived the Apostle. And uh, his son said to me one night, he said, you know, my father's total philosophy in life was, no matter what the situation, don't panic. And he said, my father's a good swimmer, so I'm sure he would have jumped overboard into the lifeboat and swam fast. <laughs> so, but that was his philosophy. I'd now like to uh, just quickly, in the letter that was written to, from the Home Office to the families, don't know if we, whether they wrote to people in Germany and Austria, but this is a letter that was written to a family in England that to express that the son had, or father had drowned in the Abosso, and it signed off, I remain your obedient servant. Good old English. Anyway, what I want to do now is talk about some of the new boys, what happened to them after the war, when they got back. The first one I'd like to talk to you about is Stephen Strauss, the man who became the judge. Stephen Strauss uh, was in Hay in Chatura, and one day some people used to, Christian people, used to visit some of these internees. And she, this woman in particular became aware that young Stephen was very bright. So she got him some books and he did the legacy certificate behind barbed wire. And he won a scholarship to the University of Melbourne. But the government wouldn't release him because he was German. But after the war, he learned that his sister had died in the camp and his mother had never traced. He decided to stay in Australia and study law. It's my interest. And he became a Queen's Counsel and he became a judge of the family court, the Honourable Stephen Strauss, or Siegfried Strauss is his Germanic name, but he anglicised it as Stephen. And so he served as a judge of the family court and I thought, wow, that's interesting, and I wrote it into my assignment. And when I got my assignment back, I thought I'd try and find him, but then try to find a retired judge of the family court, let alone a man by the name of Strauss, in a phone book was impossible. Family court couldn't help me, of course, you know, they wouldn't tell you the contact details of a judge, particularly the family court. So I searched far and wide, I looked up a few S. Strausses and couldn't find him in anywhere. And then one night I thought, I don't know what I'll do, I'll just put Stephen Strauss and De Niro, something simple. Well, this hit came up, a law firm in Queensland. I thought, I wonder if his son might work for the law firm. So I rang up and I said, I'd like to speak to Mr. Strauss. And the secretary said, what do you want to speak to him about? He's a very private man. He used to be a family court judge. I thought, hold on a minute. The guy would be in his 80s. What's he doing working in the law firm? Anyway, I said, it's a matter before he became a judge. She said, oh, I'll see if he'll speak to you. Hello, Mr. Everett, this is Stephen Strauss. How can I help you? I said, I did an assignment on the De Niro. And he said, oh, I was a boy on that boat, you know. And he said, we had a good chat. He said, look, if you ever come up to Queensland, come and see me. Well, I could do it now. But anyway, come and see me. He said, I might be 85, but I still work four days a week. And uh, he said, may I read your assignment? I said, nothing too flat. Only, you know, 4,000 words as an external student. He said, no, I like to read at night. 
So I sent him my assignment, and uh, a couple of weeks later he rang me and said, Mr. Herbert, you've written a really good paper. You even mentioned me in it. He said, listen, next week we're having a reunion from the old guys from the boat. Why don't you come and talk to us about your research? I said, really? He said, yeah, you tell him Stephen Strauss invited you. So I went to kill the town hall, not knowing anyone, walked into this hall, and this elder, he died a few years ago. This elderly man walked up to me and said, you must be John Abbott. I said, why do you think that? He said, well, have a look around this room. You're the youngest by 50 years. Who else could you possibly be? So he introduced me to people, and these people came to me from everywhere. And one man said, listen, I live in Bondi in Sydney. Why did I take you to the Holocaust Museum? I said, I didn't know there was one. And my life dramatically changed, so I've learned a lot. So that's Stephen Strauss. Another man was this Ugo Benelli. His son and I, we have a chat every so often about things. And he sent me this photograph of his father. He became the director of Janssen Swimwear. And he said, oh, he came to England when he was a young boy. And uh, as I said, they tried to sink him on the Dora Star at the Nera, the Apostle. And he lived a good life. And Henry James became a good friend of my wife and I and our family. And uh, he was a, uh, he lived in Berlin and his mother and uh, father, his father on the Iron Cross in World War I as a German officer in the Western Front. But uh, he wouldn't leave Germany because Hitler would look after his veterans. But he was Jewish and he died in Tupinco. But Henry told me some interesting things as well, and uh, he told me the day before that the Nero left England, there's one side, I don't know the right, the right word, but the man who looked after them when they were in England, he said, I've got a meeting tomorrow with Adolf Eichmann, and he has to sign the visas, because Eichmann's in charge of immigration, as it were, and so they got their visas signed by Eichmann. But Henry is a good friend, he told me many things and gave me a photograph of his father with the spike hat and the Victoria Cross, not the Victoria Cross, the Iron Cross. So we learned a lot from that. Another famous De Niro boy was a man called Franz Stamfel. He was an Austrian boy. He came to Austria, not from Austria after the Anschluss. And uh, he had a, unfortunately a quadriplegic in 1980. But his most interesting claim to fame is he was an athletics coach and he went back to England. And in the 1950s, he trained a man called Dr. Roger Bannister to run the four minute mile. And he was Bannister's coach. Interesting story about Roger Bannister running the four minute mile. Many of you will have seen Chariots of Fire. The, the timekeeper, when Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile, was Harold Abrahams, the man the Jewish man who uh, won the gold medal in the Olympics where Liddell did not run. Another interesting De Niro boy was Barney Barnett. He went back to England. His Germanic name was Horst Blumenthal. But like many of the Niro boys, they anglicised their name and he called himself Barney Barnett. And uh, he served in D-Day. And he told me one day he was driving a tank through the streets of France, and the tank was hit by a German rocket. And he said he had to get out of the tank and we were taken to a Starlag. And the German commandant of the Starlag didn't know that I was German, let alone Jewish. And he said I was as black as the ace of spades. I'd been in this tank, I was covered in soot. And he said the German officer said to me, the Allies must be getting desperate. They've even got you Indians driving tanks. <laughs> but he said, I survived the Holocaust because I was in a Starlag from May, um, June 44 to May 45. And then he said, I came back to Australia because I wanted to get away from Europe. Another interesting De Niro boy was a guy called Werner Pels, P-E-L-Z. He was a Jewish boy from Germany, he came to Australia on the De Niro. But while he was out here, he met an Anglican minister and he became a Christian. Subsequently, he became an Anglican minister and he went back to England and was on the BBC as 
Christianity Today or whatever some of this program. But then late in life he became disillusioned, he lost his faith, he came back to Australia and he did some studies and he became a lecturer in sociology at La Trobe University. And one of his students told me he used to always talk about his life, being German Jewish, Christian minister, atheist. And so the student, Roger Arbel, wrote a book about him, about Werner Fels. Another interesting De Niro boy, a man you might have sometimes said, his name is Max Brook, B-R-U-C-H. He became a famous Australian actor. There's actually a, a, a movie made about De Niro boys, and Max is the only the true De Niro boy that actually appears in the film. He actually plays his own part. Another interesting De Niro boy was Richard Sommerfeld. I had several uh, discussions by email with Richard, and I was hoping that he would come to Australia for one of our reunions, but unfortunately, this man passed away. But Richard Sommerfeld is an interesting guy. He um, came to Australia on the De Niro, again, German Jewish, and uh, while he was on the route to Australia, his mother and father managed to get a visa to go to America. And uh, they went to America and uh, they then wrote to the Australian Prime Minister when Richard arrived to say, why is our boy behind barbed wire when America's not even at war? We'd like Richard to come to America. And so the government agreed to release him and he went back from Australia on the De Niro's return voyage to India and then across the Pacific to America. When he was in America, um, he was still German and nothing really happened and then the war turned bad and uh, against the Allies and he joined, he became an American citizen and he joined the American army and he served under General Patton in the Battle of the Bulge. But the interesting thing about Richard, apart from those two things, at the end of the war, his commanding officer recognised that Richard spoke several languages fluently. So he took him to a man named Robert Jackson, Chief Prosecutor at Nuremberg. And Richard Sonnenfeld, former German Jewish, former internee, became the Chief Allied Interpreter at Nuremberg. He wrote a book called Witness to Nuremberg. And in it, I remember two things. One, when he first met Goering, called him Gehring, and Gehring in German means little man. Shall we say the Reich Marshal corrected him and said the word is Gehring, and the response was anything to say Gehring. And the other thing Richard recounted, the hardest thing in the interpreter's box was to sit across the, the aisle three metres from the Nazis in the dock every day of the trial. So, pretty amazing. Um, another couple of interesting people, Oswald and Chris Balkenstein. They were two Catholic boys in Austria, and with the answers occurring, father and mother decided to go to England, take the boys to England. They enrolled them in a leading Catholic school in England, and on the way to school one day, or coming home from Mass, Two British soldiers said to Richard and uh, sorry Oswald and Chris, "You got to come with us." And they put him in a uh, away in a van. Next thing the family knew, the two boys were on their way to Australia on the De Niro. Um, one of the De Niro boys, I don't know much about. It was a Catholic Jesuit priest, German, living in England, therefore a threat to security. He uh, wrote to Archbishop Mannix. Daniel Mannix, the Archbishop of Melbourne, and uh, when the new boys arrived in Melbourne, the two boys were offered a scholarship to a leading Catholic school in Melbourne, Xavier College. So they got released early, and uh, one of them, Oswald, his wife is still alive, and we talk about him probably every couple of weeks. So it's amazing what you can come by. Uh, another interesting guy was Emil Wittenberg. He drew a lot of the sets for 
Snow White or Sergeant Snow White in a play that the uh, De Niro boys put on when they were in the uh, Eighth Employment Company. And he did a number of paintings that you can find in that book if you want to look through that. Um, and his niece tells me regularly lots of things about Emil. Another interesting guy was Luigi. I'll call him that if I give you his name. Um, he was an uh, Italian man and uh, he was on the De Niro and he didn't want to go back to England. He wanted to stay here. He didn't want to join the Australian Army because they were sort of against it. So he decided to stay here and after the war he decided to live in Melbourne and he got a job as a waiter in a restaurant or a cafe in Melbourne. And uh, time went by and he fell in love with the proprietor's young teenage daughter. Shall we say the proprietor wasn't totally impressed. The Luigi at the time was probably 35, the daughter was probably 17 at best, and Italian and internee. So you can need to say father wasn't impressed. So he told the daughter she couldn't see Luigi. That didn't stop the young teenage daughter. She decided to still see him. So the father boarded up the doors and the windows of the house. But that didn't stop the daughter. She managed to get out and Luigi and the young girl eloped. Shall we say, father wasn't totally impressed. So he went to Arthur Corbell, Minister of uh, Immigration. And the minister ordered that uh, Luigi be deported. I don't know the, the basis of the charge, probably corrupting a minor or something like that, I guess. But anyway, Corbell ordered him to be deported. And uh, through my research through Trove, all things. Uh, you've got some old magazines, newspapers. There was a report at the, at the court when Luigi challenged his deportation. And on the day of the hearing, before the judge, Luigi said to the immigration lawyer, I voluntarily go back to England if the minister revokes the deportation order. The minister agreed to revoke it, and so Luigi, and then uh, the young woman, now of age, said to her family, I'm going with him, you'll never see me again. And true to the word, they went to England. I found some report that they had a child, and then I thought, I wonder where the child is. He had a rather common Italian name. And I thought, anyway, I did some searching, did some more searching. I had two years of searching. Not every day, mind you, I had a full time job to do and family and other commitments. And eventually found this man in Singapore who told me that he was Luigi's and this woman's son. <coughs> and we chat regularly and often. And this year, being the 80th anniversary of the Venera, I was hoping we'd come to the reunion. But with the coming of the virus and no reunion, hopefully we might come out next year. Interesting side trip to that was, I used to have a staff member of my team at work, and he was Italian. And we used to talk about some of these uh, Italian-related issues with him. And I told him about this man, I found this son, and he said, what was this guy's, um, what was the wife's name? And I gave the wife's name and he said, guess what, that father who forbade the daughter to see him, he sponsored my mother and father to come to Australia in 1950. So, amazing what you come by. Another De Niro boy was a man called Erwin Fabian. He only died last year. He was 104. If you like to look up on the, the net or anywhere, he was a famous sculptor. His sculptures were not, I won't say unusual, but different. And uh, I never met Erwin, but uh, his sculptures, uh, many of them in that book as well, that you can find. So, and De Niro always led an interesting life and uh, many of them made major contributions to Australia. People say, you know, you know turn normally, that's true. There, there's no. There's no probably justification for legally or morally that they were deported. To say they would assist the enemy is probably totally and utterly incorrect, both from a legal perspective and a moral perspective. But as one De Niro boy told me, he said, we were safe. It was far better to be behind barbed wire in hay than going up a chimney in arteries. And that got me really thinking too, because Many of our own Australian men and women went to war, never knew what was before them, 
and many of them never came back. Um, some years ago, at work, I met a, uh, one of the few survivors from Sendaka, the Jap prisoner of war camp, where two and a half thousand were imprisoned and only six came home. So war is never good. But I'd like to thank you all for coming and listening tonight. I'd like to thank the History Council for giving me the opportunity to speak, particularly part of History Week. And I'd like to thank you especially Mary and her team and the library for allowing this facility to be available to us, to allow it to be a face-to-face -face session rather than Zoom. We were going to do it on Zoom, but then they said, we'll do it in History Week, and of course, I grabbed the opportunity. And I'd just like to thank you all. And finally, I'd like to share a story I read some years ago about a Mexican revolutionary, nothing to do with Tamira. And uh, he wanted to encourage the Mexicans to overthrow the Spanish. His name was Pancho Villa. And uh, shall we say the Spanish weren't happy with his attitude. So he was tried for treason. And he was sentenced to death by firing squad. And this is a true story. And just before he was executed, the governor of Mexico came to him and said, Pancho, do you have any dying words you might like to share with the people? And what he said was in Spanish, obviously, but the English translation is as follows. Do not let it end like this. Just tell everyone you meet that I said something. Again, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight <coughs> and listening to someone who learned a little bit about the Mira and its travels. And thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was fascinating. I, I really enjoyed that. I didn't know anything about this um, before I started chatting to John, and it was a pleasure to listen to that talk. It was just extremely interesting. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? One of the most remarkable things, there's no females. There were only boys, only men who got deported out. Well, that's true, but interesting story. Um, one of the new boys told me, Stephen Strauss, of all people, at one of the reunions, brought his young teenage daughter to the reunion. And one of the new boys said to the young Miss Strauss, Oh, I didn't see you on the Venera. <laughs> but no, these uh, were people who were. Yeah, uh, some of the, well, see, the, well, on the Queen Mary, there were men, women, and children were brought out. Oh, yeah. But the ones who, uh, in England, that they felt were more a threat and would join the German forces, I guess they thought men, and they didn't, like, they didn't read, uh, in turn, some women were interned in other parts, um, particularly in Australia and in America, some Japanese women were interned. But, uh, but at least Queen Mary ones that came out, uh, they came out on the Queen Mary, you know what I mean, talking to the cruise ship. Um, they were kept behind the barbed wire, segregated of course. Um, and yeah, I don't know what the church all of a sudden say, on the new it's only going to be men. But, but I, uh, yeah, there was none interned. But the Queen Mary did bring internees. How they got from, Europe to Singapore, I'm not really sure, but there were even young children in turn. But they, and they t went from being on the Queen Mary to return behind barbed wire. And some of the women were pregnant, and some of the women gave birth whilst behind barbed wire. I mean, they may not have given birth per se directly behind barbed wire, they may have gone to the hospital, I don't know. I don't know who they were in. But, uh, yeah. Right. Just just picking up on your point, were there the, the men who were, were taken from, from Britain, did they have um, families in Britain? Yes, they did. And what happened to those? Some of them know? went back to those families, right? And then some of the ones on the ship that were sunk, the Abosso, mm -hmm. um, their families were in England because the letter I read to you mm -hmm. was written to a family member in England, a son actually. Oh, that must have been so dreadful for them. And some of them didn't even know what had happened. Even Ugo Benelli, he, his son told me that uh, his mother used to receive letters from Ugo when he was in Australia. Mm -hmm. 
in New York. Right. And would they, would they, given, were they told that they would be released at the end of the war or, or were they just interned? When they were first interned, yeah. they, well, they didn't even know where they were going. They thought they were going to Canada. Okay. But then uh, one of the Danube boys told me, one of the um, Danube boys um, was a sailor and said, the ship's turning south. I don't know why. And so they asked, got to somebody, one of the officers, and said, you're going to Australia then. And the, the, the new one who told me said, I said to the officer, what's in Australia? And he said, convicts and kangaroos. <laughs> oh. But yeah, these amazing stories. But yeah, um, and some of the loved ones um, um, were, some of them went back and reunited with loved ones. And, and, and some of them uh, found families alive in Europe. There were some of the new boys whose families survived, but many of the new boys tell me that they didn't have uh, their loved ones. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened to them to this day. You know, the Germans came and yeah. took large numbers away. And um, so, yeah, it's a, you ever heard of it before? No. no. So you never know, there could be people out there and. Uh, what was the range of ages then? Pardon? What were the ages of the people? Did you hear a voice? The, range of ages. the youngest was 16. Right. Our, our friend Piers, Dad. And uh, 68 was the oldest. Yeah. Uh, Henry, James, the one I mentioned, he was um, 18, I think, and uh, he was going to a group called the Ord Group, which was like an industrial technical high school. And the only reason they got a visa was the. Uh, they convinced the, the Nazis to take people uh, to England to learn a bit more of the trade to bring it back for the greater good of the Reich. And uh, Eichmann signed it. <laughs> they had no intention of coming Obviously back. Obviously that was before the war. Then. Yeah. Well, 31st of August, 39, he arrived in England. Mm. We're talking three days before Poland. Yeah. Yeah, well, they left a bit late. Yeah. But, you know, they had to... And yeah, they had to fit in three days. They didn't know where they were going in it as well, you know, they, one day a British soldier tapped you on the shoulder, come with me, and, yeah. and so, yes, they were wrongly in turn, but then, to that extent, they were safe, and... Mm. So my uncle was 19. What? My uncle was 19. Yeah, 19, so... <laughs> and, yeah, and, and this, this is about, on a fair estimate, probably a dozen the new boys still alive in Australia, and probably another dozen across the world. There was two whose sons, became, one of them became, uh, became a member of the House of Lords. He died earlier this year, Lord Eden, not Anthony Eden, but um, Peter Eden. And uh, another one um, died earlier, and um, his son is now Lord Stern. Have you heard of Lord Stern? Deal with uh, climate change. Is the Chief spokesperson in England. His father was beautiful. And we lost one a couple of weeks ago. He was 99. Uh, the, and that one, the mother and father sent three boys to England to begin the way. And uh, the mother and father um, died in Auschwitz about on one of the last trains of Berlin. How do you see the Dunedin boys? falling into, uh, you see, in a number of people that were bought out from England. I mean, all these boys that were bought out, you know, after the war, when they were taken away from their parents and brought out, and, you know, we had the one at Morong and yeah. know, places like that. So you do see this, the, the part of the totality of human beings being shipped to Australia. Yeah, basically, yeah. That's, and uh, unfortunately, they became you know, okay, they develop skills here that they use for the yeah. greater good. I mean, Stephen Strauss, I mean, doing the leaving city behind the barbed wire and winning a scholarship to the University of Melbourne. And two ships are sunk on the way back to Wollonga. It's about seven drowned. And uh, the Yabosso. And the Yabosso. Only the Yabosso, interesting, came by in an interesting way. Uh, one of the reunions, I just happened to say this to the Uruguay, I said, oh, did you say we'll go back? And he said, oh, I was due to go back in late 42, but the ship before me 
were sunk and they nearly all drowned. And I said, oh, gee, what was the name of that ship? And he said, oh, too long ago. And I said, all I know is I was due to leave in October 42. So I found the date the different ships left and what ship left. And, and uh, there was a ship, called, they got on a ship called the Western Land and it went from Sydney to Perth to Fremantle to South Africa. And when the South Africa they got off and they got it on to the boss that left. Yeah, the sunk unfortunately and um, but this woman with the handbag, I, I know her name but her name's Franklin of all things, but uh, I haven't been able to buy anything else on her at the moment. Her next of kin according to the uh, uh, survivors list list of Franklin in New Zealand. But I don't even know what her first name was. So this is Franklin. But they were going to England for a holiday at the time, so, in 1942. Well, I was born in Tasmania, Polish. My mum was Polish, my father was Czech, and there was no doctor there. And um, the nurse, the midwife who delivered me, was planning a trip to England by bikes, bicycle. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah. <laughs> but some of the stories you read are some of the... geography was really... Oh, yeah. <laughs> all, all current affairs, as these people must have thought, going to England for a holiday yeah, at that time. And some of them served and uh, I read a report that uh, two of them at least that I was aware of were in uh, the RAF and their plane was shot down they bailed out and they were captured and executed by the Gestapo. I don't know their names, I just read a, um, an extract about the um, some of the new boys who fought in Europe. And, um, and then one of them was on Bomber Command and some of them served on some of them. Interesting about the Abbasso too was the man who, his uh, daughter who tells me this one, not Ugo Manelli, but this RAF guard told me that uh, when he got off the ship, out of the lifeboat on board the ship, the man who sort of helped him on board was his schoolmate. His schoolmate had joined the Royal Navy and uh, William, the one who was rescued, he, t he joined the Air Force and, and when he got out of the lifeboat, this guy helped him on board. So... Does anybody else have any questions? You can give my email if you want to send me an email or talk to me. Or Um, we really appreciate it. So thank you.